Well, good morning. It's good to be with you guys this morning. You know, I had the privilege of kind of ending our uh, series we've been in the past six weeks, The Power of Love, and we have spent a considerable amount of time on the subject of love and shown you different ways to use it in your life and in your life's journey. And we did that because we feel like love is the foundation or should be our foundation in which everything comes up and out. When Jesus walked the earth, right, and he was teaching, one of the uh, people, one of the disciples that was with him and stuff asked him, you know, Lord, what's the most important thing that, that we get from the scriptures? You know, the whole book. Just can you kind of boil it down, like give me the cliff notes, right? And so Jesus responds, the most important thing that you are to get is that you need to learn to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, and with all of your soul, and with all your strength, which means every day of your life, and with all your mind. And then he says, then I want you to learn to love your neighbor, and who's my neighbor? Those are anybody that God puts in your proximity, that you're to love them. And so that's what it's all about. That is what life is all about, learning to harness the power of love. Now, we know that this is called the great commandment. And uh, right, sometimes, you know, when I'm talking, it sounds, oh, that sounds wonderful as you're up there, you know, that sounds so easy. But I have some really difficult people in my life. Well, guys, love is a choice. Love is a choice. And I really feel that we can do this. We can take on this challenge. God didn't give us something that we couldn't do. We can choose and lean into loving people. But we can only do that as much as we are connected to the Trinity, the third person in the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. As much as you are connected with him, that's how you're able to love like that. And today I want to talk to you about being connected in, being able to, to feel God's love in your own life and let him wash you clean, and therefore you can be a conduit to just other people, to loving other people, right? Good, so I want to talk to you today about how God can help each and every one of us become more sensitive to allow the Holy Spirit to uh, prompt things in our lives that we can be a loving person. So why don't you bow your heads with me, and I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to even come more this morning. Father God, I know that this message is from you. I know that you don't just love, that you are love, and that as children of the God Most High, you require that, you want that in us, you want us to develop that. So Holy Spirit, come now. Come now and sweep over, Father. Distractions, uh, just put them away. Father, I ask that your Holy Spirit can come and that you would cause our synapses to come alive this morning, that we would hear you, Father, the one true God, that we would hear your voice and that we would know that you speak to us individually, Lord. So come be glorified this morning in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, if somebody were to call you a fence sitter, would that be a compliment? No, it's not a compliment, is it? Not at all. What they're saying is you have a hard time making a decision on, it, on things, right? Whether they're important or not, you know, you kind of perch yourself up on that fence of indecision. Well... That's called fence sitting, right? I want to talk to you today about that, and I'm going to tell you and do that by telling you three stories from the Bible. And I believe in these three stories, we can see how the Holy Spirit helped people to get off the fence of indecision and make decisions in their life. So the first story, and it's on your outline, is found in the Old Testament. It's about a man named Joshua. Now, Joshua is the successor, right, to Moses, and Moses, you know, worked with the people, uh, the Israelites, and so now, here you go, Jacob, uh, yeah, let me think here. Wow, okay, let me just stop for a second. All right, okay, all right, I'm getting ahead of myself. So here you go, Joshua, Joshua is a mighty man. He worked with Moses, and he is coming in underneath Moses, and he's going to be the one who's going to actually lead the people out of the promised land, uh, out of the Egypt to the promised land. And so what we see here is that this guy, uh, you know, he's taking these people into this land, and he's helping them to, to find this home and to enjoy this place. And so here you go. He, in this book in Joshua, it's a very good book. In this book of Joshua, what we see is towards the end now, Joshua's gotten old, and so Joshua has, has enjoyed, you know, leading these people and helping them, stuff like that, but now he's getting old, and so he's walking through the, 
the land, and he's kind of looking over everything, and he's talking, you know, to the people, and then all of a sudden, he begins to realize that something has taken place. There's been a switch with these folks, and so he can't believe his eyes. He can't believe what he's seeing. People are falling into spiritual complacency. They're complacent in what they're, what they're, with their faith. You know, they're not going to worship anymore. They're not praying to the one true God. You know, they're just kind of going through the motions, right? Not only that, they're, they're getting really involved with the, the neighboring nations. And so now they're starting to grab hold of their ideas, their values, and their practices. And so Joshua now, he's seeing this and he's going, wow, I can't believe this is happening. And so now Joshua is going, ah, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And he's, you know, he makes this statement like, I just can't stand it anymore. I've got to do something. I believe this is where Popeye got it from, by the way. I just can't stand it anymore. I've got to do something. So what Joshua does is he calls a leadership meeting. He has all the the, uh, leaders of the tribes of Israel come to talk to him. He calls them, and he says, listen, I can't believe this is happening right now. I can't believe this is going on and what I'm seeing here, you know, that this one true God that that we cried out to when we were captive, you know, in uh, Egypt, when we were captive there, and, you know, we were made to make bricks without straw, and we were struggling, and we were being oppressed and abused, and we cried out, and the one true God, he did hear us. He heard us, you know, and he answered us in a mighty way. He put those 10 plagues down, and he freed us, and he opened up the sea, right? And if that weren't enough to bring us that freedom... He also prepared the land that you live in today. See, you're living in cities you did not build, and you're living and eating and prospering off the ground, that you didn't plant those vineyards and those olive groves, yet you're able to harness those and use those. And all this because our God loves us. And here you are, you're sitting on the fence. You know, you're playing around with these idols because they were grabbing hold of the the nations around them, and they would, you know, have idols, and they would bring them into their home and, and uh, put them on this mantle, right? And he started worshiping them. And, and so Joshua says, I can't believe what I'm seeing. I can't believe this. And then Joshua makes this very famous um, statement, and we see it a lot when we go around to, to uh, different bookstores and stuff. They'll have them, and he says this, choose for yourself these day, this day. Who will you serve? Choose today who you serve. So he's saying, moving forward from here into the future, who will you serve? You have to choose. You have to choose. Are you going to choose the one true God? Or are you going to choose these little wooden idols? But you got to make a choice. You have to get off the fence. And today is the day of decision. And then Joshua does something very courageous. He not only issues the get off the fence talk, he says, hmm, and in that verse 15, further on, he says, But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And so he stands up to bring leadership, and he says, that's what I'm going to do, guys. Everybody in my household, we will follow the Lord. So he issues this. He looks right at the problem. He calls it out. He calls to the people, and then he demonstrates the behavior by saying, I'm going to, to follow the Lord, the one true God. Now, the scriptures tell us that the people were cut to the heart here, that they heard this and that 10,000 of them that day decided to get off the fence, that they decided that they wanted to follow the one true God, right? That they went home and that they took down those idols and that they decided to turn around and to follow after God. And the scriptures tell us that peace and prosperity happened. But I want you to see that it all happened because there was this discussion of getting off the fence And people heard it, and they moved. So the second story I want to show you, talk to you about, is this one here in the New Testament. In the New Testament, it's about the Apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost. And it's in Acts 2. You remember this? In Acts 2. On the day of Pentecost, what happens is the Holy Spirit, which is God's power, right? It comes in the upper room where the disciples are, and it comes in power, and it comes and it just rattles the room, you know, and lots of stuff going on. And what happens is there's this new release of power to the disciples, right? There's this new release of the Holy Spirit. That's the, the third part of that trinity. And so now it's released to the people. And so there's this sense and there's birth of a new optimism that, wow, what is God going to do in our midst, right? 
What is he going to do in the city of Jerusalem? There's this excitement. And so Peter, after he has this encounter, he walks out into the city center of Jerusalem. And I think of the city center of Jerusalem just like the uh, city center in Virginia Beach, you know, that area over there, right? That's what I think of. And I I see here that that Peter gets up and he walks out to the plaza, right? And, And he's looking at all that's going on around him. And he's looking at all the businesses, conducting their businesses, the, the selling and the buying of stuff. And, and life's going on as normal. And Peter's going, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Not that long ago. Not that long ago, there was a death. There was a burial. There was a resurrection. And there was an ascension of Jesus Christ that happened right here. And there's these you know, history-making events that were going on right here. Why are you people going around? It's like nothing happened. I can't, I can't get it. And then I can almost hear the cry in Peter's voice when Peter goes, I can't stand it anymore, right? I got to say something about it. And that's exactly what he does. That's exactly what the scriptures say, that he was in the, the plaza in, in Jerusalem, again, like our town center, and he found you know, an embankment, like the, the water fountain that's in you know town center and he stands on he goes people listen to me right listen to me and so he starts to pour out what has happened he says did you forget do you not know what transpired here not that long ago just 10 10 blocks from here you know in the short in the short past do you not remember do you not remember that the god of the universe the God who made the whole world, the God who human beings rejected, this God, he didn't turn his back on us. No, he fulfilled a promise from long ago, and he sent his only begotten son to come in flesh, and his name was Jesus, and you know him. You know him. He he was born in Bethlehem. You know him. You heard his teachings, his magnificent teachings. You saw the miracles. You saw him raised from the dead. There were 500 of you who actually saw his body. You saw him. You saw this man love us like nobody else could love us. And you saw this man take on the establishment. You saw him fearlessly fight the establishment, those powers. And then you watched the religious leaders. You watched them accuse him falsely and arrest him. And then you saw them condemn him falsely and beat him within an inch of his life. And you watched it. You watched it as they took him out and they crucified him unjustly on a cross. You watched it all and you didn't lift a finger to help. And Peter looks at him and he says, you just sat on the fence. You just sat on the fence while God's son was murdered. And you just watched. And then he says, You are complicit in that death. You are complicit. You have a part in it. And then Peter says, but here's the good news. God arranged for the sins of the world to be placed on the shoulders of Jesus Christ so that his death was not pointless. His death meant that we now have an atoning sacrifice, not just for us, but for all mankind. So God used it. And listen, You know, you know that he was resurrected and he walked with us. You know that, and you know that he ascended into heaven. And so this history-making stuff happened right here, and you're going on like business as usual. You can't do that. You can't do that. It's just you cannot do it. You're complicit and you have no regrets. And so Peter just pours out his, his heart, and he recounts history with everyone. And then the scriptures tell us in Acts, in Acts 2, 37, it says, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. What should we do? They asked Peter, what should we do? How can we make this thing right? And then Peter says, listen, first you got to get off a fence, the fence of indecision. You have to get off of that. And then you have to admit your complicity. You have to admit your wrongdoings, that you sin, that you've fallen short. And then you need to ask God, Son, Jesus Christ, the risen Christ, for forgiveness. And then, one last step, you got to be baptized publicly. you got to be baptized. And so, Peter, he just says, this is what you need to do to make it right. 
And in the book of Acts, we see where 3,000 people heard that, heard that get off the fence comments. They heard that and then they reacted and they, 3,000 of them, they admitted their complicity in the Christ's death and they, they asked for forgiveness and 3,000, all 3,000, not one, not 100, all 3,000 were baptized, all of them. Now, this all comes back and we can see in history that you have a seat today. There's a thing called the church because this one man got up fearlessly and he gave the get off the fence talk and people responded. And because of that, this is the horsepower that God used these, you know, these people to go out into the known world to establish the first church. And then we have 2016, we have this church because of them. And it came from this talk. Guys, the get off the fence is what the Holy Spirit is saying today. This last story I want to tell you comes from the book of Revelation. Now, we don't talk about the book of Revelation very much, but I, I want to share something that I saw that impacted me. The apostle John, right, he's aging, and the Holy Spirit told him to write this book. And so he writes it, and I want us to look at the first couple of chapters here. You know, the apostle John, he's writing the letters to these seven churches, and he's giving them encouragement and direction, and he's giving them warning and some prophetic things he's saying to them. And I want us to focus in, now here's my heart, I want us to focus in on Revelation 3, right? Revelation 3, because there's this letter he writes to one of the uh, cities called Laodicea. I believe Laodicea is a lot like us, a lot like Tidewater area, you know? I mean, it talks about, you know, them being cultured people and diverse people and people of means and people that live by a lovely body of water, right, where everybody wanted to go and to live at. Sounds a lot like Tidewater to me, right? And so in this, this letter, John feels compelled by the Holy Spirit to write it to Laodicea, and God's Spirit's moving, and he says, this is what God is saying about you. You have everything the world wants. You've got this attractive, beautiful city. You have a wonderful church. You have affluence. Now, here's the problem. And in Re Revelation 3.15, he says, I know your deeds, that you are neither hot nor cold. Neither hot nor cold. Wow. What he's saying is, he's saying, hey, you're neither one or the other. You say you love me, but you're neither one or the other. I wish you were piping hot for me. You know, I wish you were piping hot for me and passionate, or I just wish you would turn on your heels and shake your fist at me and go, no, I don't believe in you, but be one or the other. You see, God doesn't do tepid. That's what you see here. God does not do tepid. He doesn't do warm, you know, warmth, he, you know, the warmness or the fence sitting. He just cannot do that. And when I look at this scripture, when I look at Revelation 3.15, you know, it beckons the obvious question to me, who knows I serve a God of love, why? Why doesn't God do tepid? Why is he so stern with it? And I really think it's because God gave it all, man. He laid down everything. He watched his only begotten son abused and killed and he gave him for you and for me and all these things happened so that you and I would have a chance at redemption, that we would have a second chance in life so that you and I could have the grace and the mercy given to us. And so God put everything he had there. And I believe that when you give everything like that, you cannot put up with this mediocrity where they are fence sitting. So God can't do that. And I believe that God just wishes that we would go as a people, that you and I would begin to recognize all that he has given us and the response that God's looking for us is, yes, God, I love you. I understand the redeeming power that you have given me, that gift of salvation that you and you alone have given me. I understand this. I understand that I am forgiven for much sins, and I am your daughter, and I am your son. And because of that, that privilege of doing that and being that kind of person, Lord, I dedicate the rest of my life for you. I will live red hot for you because I understand that. Or God says, I just wish you'd go, I don't believe this story anyway, and just turn on your heels and walk away. God wants one or the other. He wants one or the other. And in that text, 
in Revelation 3, 16, moving on, it says, so because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. I mean, these are not, these are not endearing, loving, these are like, hey, fence sitting makes me sick. That's what God is saying here. That's what John is reporting, that God doesn't do tepid. He can never do tepid because he's too vested. So he speaks this. John speaks this to the church of Laodicea. Now they have a choice. He calls out the problem. He calls it out and says, hey, no more fence sitting from this day forward. No more mediocrity. No more sitting still and, and not being hot or cold. You must get off the fence. Now, the thing I find very interesting in this account, in the book of Revelation, is that unlike the other two stories, you do not know how the Laodiceans responded. You just don't know how they responded. You know, were they hot now? You know, did they remain cold? You know, what, what did they do? They, you don't know. And I believe because it's for the church today. I think it's for us. I think it's that call to us to get off the fence. Now, you might be saying to yourself, why are you telling us these three stories? You know, what is it here? Well, I believe that God directed me to tell you these three stories, to tell you about the fence sitting, because I think that there are a lot of us, and we have these things in our lives. Maybe God's been talking to you and speaking to you about, I don't know, reconciling with somebody who, who you're at odds with, Right? And you've been on the fence, should I do it, should I do it? They don't deserve it, and whatever. But God is speaking to you today about reconciliation, about going and talking to them today, about loving them more than you're possible. Or maybe God's talking to you about your work environment or about your school environment, you know, and, and those things that you're seeing or maybe even participating in that you know go against God's word, yet you particularly do them and so maybe God is moving on you today and he's saying, hey, get off this fence of indecision about your faith and the values I've been teaching you and lean into what you know is right. And so maybe there's that call to that. Or maybe there are many of you who are spiritually complacent, you know, where you just kind of found yourself coming in and doing the thing you need to do. I'm here at church. I'm good. I got my life insurance, right? Right? And so you just kind of go through the motion and you struggle with the culture, you know, and, and wanting to lean into those values and, and your faith, your wishy-washy about your faith. Well, God is calling to you to get off the fence of the indecision about your faith. He's saying, no, no, be red hot or be, or be cold and walk away. But don't sit on that fence any longer. And maybe there are some of you guys here today and you have never heard the story about what Jesus Christ did for you, how your rebellion and my rebellion put him on that cross. And today is the day of salvation for you. Listen, the Holy Spirit is moving today. He's moving into these three stories. And he's going to move even more in this last story. This last story is my story. It's your story. You see, we each and every one of us, we have been fence sitters. We are fence sitters today on different issues. And so I want to talk to you today about the fence sitting and how that can, can keep us from learning to love the God that who we profess with all our heart, all our mind, all our soul, with all our strength. You know, I, I see this and I see it especially in baptism. No better place to have it shown than in baptism. And I want to talk to you about that for a moment. You know, Andy and I, we do every 101 together. That's our membership class. That's where we, we talk to newcomers into this church. And, and every time we go to teach, I'm always raising my hand, I want to teach baptism, you know? I love to teach baptism. I love to talk to people about it and show them in the scriptures what it says and why they should be baptized, you know? And, and so when I talk to them about that, I try to make it as easy as possible. I say, you know, baptism's kind of like, you know, I love, I love my husband, Andy, and and uh, he asked me to marry him, and that was all private and good. And then I stood up in front of a whole bunch of people, and I put my wedding ring on to say, hey, this is who I love and who I'm passionate about and who I'm following all the days of my life. Baptism is like that. And so I love to tell the people about these things. And, and then one of my practices is that I always ask them, so tell me about your baptism. Have you been baptized? And, and what does that mean to you? And I love to go around the group and to hear the stories and and they're pretty cool. 
And whenever I get to a story where the person um, has not been baptized or is confused about baptism, I stop to dialogue with them. I stop to talk to them. And I hear all kinds of reasons why people don't get baptized. You know, I hear that, that uh, so, a lot, some people will come to the class and they go, well, you know, I'm still seeking the claims of Christ. So that's okay because if you don't believe in Jesus, you're right. You don't need to be baptized. If you're still trying to figure that out, it's, it's good. That's a valid reason. But then more often than not, I hear invalid reasons from people that are Christ followers who have asked God, you know, to become, or Jesus to become the leader of their life, that these folks, you know, that will come up with, a, with just an array of reasons why not, all the way from, well, I was a baby and I was baptized. No, you were christened. Because baptism is when you make the decision yourself, not when your parents or somebody else make it for you. So I'll hear that about being baptized as a baby. I hear people say, well, you know, I need to talk to my significant other or my family. No, again, it's an individual call to you to respond. And then other people will go, well, you know, every time you do it, I'm out of town, right? It's inconvenient for me. Or, hey, listen, I've been a Christian for so many years. If I got baptized, people would think I'm a new Christian, right? I can't do that. It would confuse everybody. And then my favorite, you mean get wet and have a bad hair day in front of people, <laughs> right? I hear that mostly from girls. Okay, so those are some of the things that people tell me in my 101 class. And I was praying about this and thinking about when I was talking to you guys today. And I believe that the Holy Spirit, this is what I think, I believe the moment that you cry out to God, the minute that you accept God, right, accept his son Jesus Christ, the minute that you accept that atoning work of Christ and you ask for forgiveness, the Holy Spirit just comes and completely fills you up. He doesn't make you wait until you get cleaned up. He doesn't. He comes and he fully joins himself in you and he opens up that reservoir so he can deposit himself in you fully. You don't have to wait. You don't have to wait. Remember, 3,000 that day were baptized. You don't have to wait because the Holy Spirit is there. So the Holy Spirit's job is to get you to be obedient to the scriptures, to be obedient, to follow what God tells us. And so the Holy Spirit, the first thing he'll do is to tell you to be baptized because there's a significance in it. So the, the baptism is the first test of did you give me your heart? Did you give me your all? And so that's like that first test. And I know it's hard for a lot of people. You see, when I got saved, when I found Jesus Christ, I was 18 years old. Somebody had shared who he was and, and how my sin had actually nailed him to the cross, but how he had, had forgiven me if I asked for it and how he wanted to reconcile me back to the, the one true God. And so when I heard that message, I gave my heart to Christ. But you see, I wasn't part of a church, so I didn't really hear and understand about the importance of baptism, right? I kind of just thought, okay, this is wonderful experience outside the church. I don't need the church. I don't need baptism. And I tried to do it on my own, and I failed miserably. I thought baptism was a suggestion, and I rationalized it away. Well, <laughs> I've been baptized when I was a baby because I'm Catholic, you know? And so I rationalized it away, and and in my faith, I was in the university because I was a young woman, and I couldn't for the life of me make this thing work called Christianity. I was worse than before. I struggled fearlessly. I was a horrible Christian. Got myself into so many problems. And at night when I would lay my head down, I would cry out to God. I'd say, God, I'm sorry again. You know, again, I'm sorry, God. And I would say, I have no power. Is this thing real? Why can't I go forward? And I'm a strong woman, emotionally strong. And, and, and I would cry out to God, what, what, where's the missing power here? Well, one of my friends, one of my partying friends, <laughs> actually there are a couple of girls, and they invited me to go listen to this preacher that, and it was a novel thing because she was a female. And that was novel for me. And I thought, sure, why not? Now, how many of you know that that God sometimes directs you. You think you're going to get hear one thing and you hear something else, right? Well, that's what happened to me today, that day. 
I went listen, you know, to listen to this woman, and what ends up happening is she's sick. Her husband preaches, not her. And when, she's te- when he's teaching, he teaches about following the leading of the Holy Spirit. Of course, he gives an altar call, and the two girls I'm with, the one girl, she whispers to me, I want to give my life to Jesus, but I'm afraid. Will you walk down front with me? Well, as a Christ follower, I knew what an important decision that was. I'm like, oh, now I didn't want to walk down front. I didn't want, I was wrestling because I'm thinking, whoa, everybody looking at me. And contrary to the belief here, standing up here, I don't, I don't like this job. <laughs> I don't like everybody's looking at me like this. It makes me nervous, right? So when she asked me to go down, I'm like, oh, ugh. But because I knew what an important decision it was, I said, yes. Yes, I'll do it. And so I walked down with her, but I I wish I could say my heart was good, but it was not. I was so full of pride, and I didn't want anybody to think I didn't have it together, you know? So I'm walking like, yeah, it's not me, not me, you know? I got it together. We go down, and the counselor, the the prayer counselor is praying with my friend, talking to my friend, and I'm like, yeah, I'm cool. I didn't even know a thing. I got it all together, right? And so I put my hand on her to pray for her, and all of a sudden I heard a voice. It was so loud, so audible. And it said, listen to the lady. And I thought, whoa. I opened my eyes up and thought, who is that? You know, what is that? And it said it again. You listen to the, listen to what's being said. And when I listened, the lady said, you have no power in your life because you, well, she didn't say that. She said, you have no power if you do not obey the teachings of Jesus Christ. And the first teaching in the test is to be baptized. And I thought, oh my gosh, in the closet, in my crying times at night, the very words that I was using about the lack of power was being prophetically spoke to me right then. And I could tell you, I was on the fence and there was a call to get off that fence right there and right then. And I was sitting on the fence and I thought, I want this power so bad. I'm going to get off the fence, even though it's very uncomfortable. And I didn't just walk, I ran upstairs. I wanted that baptism because of what it signified. And so when I got up there, I'm going to tell you, I was in a Pentecostal church, which is different than ours, okay? (laughs) I'm just going to say, you know, they gave me a swimsuit that looked like something out of the 1600s to put on, (laughs) right? And stuff. And so I was like, whoa, this is so out of my comfort zone, but I want you, Jesus, so bad. And I can remember to this day, and it's still emotionally just pings me whenever I share it. When I got into that water, when I got into that water, and uh, they prayed over me, and they pushed me down, you know, they helped lead me down into the water, I can remember all the, the, the worries, and all the pride issues, and all the, the failures, and all the crap that I'd gotten myself into, that was screaming in my head. When I went under that water, everything got quiet everything. And it was in there, I believe, that I reflected. And in there, I died. The old Sharon died with Jesus Christ. And I was no longer that weak person spiritually. Because when I came up and out of that water, the wind hit me. But more importantly, the Holy Spirit fell upon me in such a dynamic way that I found myself being revolutionized. I found my my ability to hear the Holy Spirit. And it's taken years to continue to learn to develop that and to follow that, but that was such a revolutionary part of my life that it's so impacting. Now you can see why. Say, no, I want to teach baptism. It's one of these places that's so vitally important for us to grow as Christ followers. And I believe today, because we have a baptism today, people have registered for this, all these services, but I believe today that Jesus Christ is talking to some of you, the Holy Spirit, and he's saying, get off the fence about baptism. You know, you came today thinking, I'm going to watch baptism, (laughs) but God wants you to participate, right? He wants you to participate, and I know you can actually sit there and rationalize, because I've done it, rationalize it, right? And you can quench the Holy Spirit trying to move and speak to you, but my friends, don't do that. Don't lean that way. Instead, embrace what you hear the Holy Spirit telling you. And I know you're going, wait a minute, you want me to be baptized today? Really? Yes, but I'll be all wet. I didn't bring clothes. 
It's okay. You got caught in the rain before, right? <laughs> you know what it feels like to be wet. And here you go. I got a shirt for you, a T-shirt. You're going to see them today in the people that are being baptized. We gave them a black shirt, and it has a strip on it. And we said, I want you to write the one word that signifies your walk with Christ right now, right? And so when they're being baptized today, read the shirts. It tells about the person being baptized. And if you're here, I'm going to give you a shirt, and you're going to be asked to write a word that, that tells you what's happened to, to you in this, this journey with Jesus, Right? And then I got a towel for you. You're going to be okay. Yeah, yeah, I got triple X all the way down to small, right? I got it all. Hey, listen, last night I had people just popping up. They're like, not just the ones, where the other people just popping up and saying, oh, I feel like God's calling me off the fence and I'm going to do this. And so they came up and they were part of that. I had people come after and talk to me and they go, I was too afraid to get up. Can I do it today? I'm like, Sure. We've got, we've got two more services. You can do it. Here's the point, guys. God is present. He's working. He's leading us. He's leading us. And the first test of obedience is to be baptized. And so if you haven't been baptized, again, I call to you, because I believe this is a Holy Spirit call, to come forward and to be able to be baptized.